Any question you would like to ask? Master, ever since I have been a young child, I have heard of the end of the world and the destruction of all life on the planet as we know it. Every day the situation seems to grow more desperate with an increase in nuclear arms in countries pitted against countries. What I want to know is if this is true or just a myth perpetrated by the negative power to lead us away from light and love. To keep us away from? To keep us away from God, to keep us away from realization. Well, you see, the Lord has created this creation, but its management definitely is in the hand of God. Thank you. And whatever you sow, so shall you reap. We come here to face the effect of our own karmas, whether they are good karmas or whether they are bad karmas, we have to face during the span of life all those karmas. Thank you, Master. Maharaji. Maharaji. <coughs> there is a maxim to your right. Yes. You have heard the maxim <coughs> eat less, sleep less, and speak less. I understand the eat less and sleep less bit. Can you speak a little bit upon the Speak less. You see, I am not in authority to say speak less. The whole, whole day I am speaking. I can definitely say eat less. And if you eat less, you will definitely sleep less. The idea behind is that unnecessary, we should not waste our energy in eating, sleeping, and uh, and eating, sleeping, and speaking. We always waste our energy. We should try to put this energy into better use, for which this human birth has been given to us. So we should preserve that energy for some better purpose. That is the idea behind it. And most of our problem in this creation is speaking. We have very big mouth, and we don't know what we say and when we say and, and how we should say. And then we can't face those problems. So if we are always conscious of what we are going to say, I think we can avoid many problems in this creation. So it's a good advice, speak less. Thank you. Uh, Master, how does one control anger that arises so quickly in the mind that one does not have time to stop it? Well, brothers, especially those people whose life have been very, very disciplined, they lose, they become very short-tempered because they cannot understand how can people be so indisciplined so unreasonable, so illogical. So they lose their temper very easily. And this is the part of very, very great people also, you will find them. We should try to control our temper. I mean, we can't expect everybody to at our level. We should try to help them to bring them, pull them to our level, rather than to lose our temper on them. And losing temple is a great problem with everyone. I think we have to fight this problem with our own self. Do we solve any problem by losing temper or we have created more problem by losing temper? If it doesn't help us in any way, if it doesn't solve the, any problem at all, then why lose temper? Just be quiet. Try to explain yourself. Try to educate yourself. And if we are determined to lease, leave temper, I think we definitely succeed. But meditation definitely helps us to rise above these things. 
But in otherwise, in life, we should always be cautious in losing temper. Unnecessarily, sometimes we go out of the way to hurt people, which is meaningless. As far as we are concerned, it hardly matters to us. Master? Yes. Over here. Um, I was wondering where I work, we work in the area of countermeasures, and we think of different scenarios, and sometimes with all the thoughts in that area, I wonder if maybe we're creating problems that wouldn't be there if so much thought didn't go into it. Would that, you comment a little? I'm, I'm not following your question. Um, like war scenarios, and like if somebody did something like this, how would we stop this from happening? Are, are we creating a bad situation by thinking of ways to stop it from happening? People that work in that area? Which area? Countermeasures. Hmm? Countermeasures. Countermeasures? Countermeasures against missiles and stuff. Where terrorism is going on? No. Then? In general defense. I'm not following your country. Um, in the Air Force? You mean uh, at airport? Force. Just to try to be clear. Oh, defense of the nation. Yes. Then? Uh, are, in thinking um, uh, ways to protect, protect your nation, are you creating the problem? Sister, I often say, we, collect, we cannot collect the thorns of the world. We can definitely put strong shoe on our feet so that they may not affect our feet. You can't improve the world, but you can improve yourself. You can't improve the area. You can definitely improve yourself. Thank you. Master? Yes. It is about three years ago that you meet me. Pardon? Please? It is three years ago that you meet me in a vision. I was at that time 52 years old. And I had a lot of questions. A lot of questions? Yes. Yes. But I... you didn't give me any answer. Today I am here and I see you. I'm uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Let's start again. It is three years ago that, you, that I meet you in a vision. And that time I had a lot of questions. Sister, if you have any question, you are most welcome to ask. If they are some of your confidential nature, private nature, you are most welcome to write to me. Okay. But now I am here. Hmm? And my question is today, that time I was 52 years old, my question is, you know me much more longer than three years. Why you didn't come earlier to me? Well, your master sister is within every one of us. Our master is right there within us. We have to reach him in order to be with him always. I have another question. I wrote in the book of you that the human body needs a master in a human body. In? In also a human body. But if I am not initiate and you will leave tomorrow, who will guide me then? Lord, He knows best whom to initiate, whom to pull, how to pull, when to pull. It is not in our hand. We can't plan these things. We have to adjust to His planning. I am glad the planning is in His hand, not in our hand. <laughs> you should leave everything to Him. Thank and you. don't unnecessarily worry about these things. 
Thank you. Master, um, does your soul affect your personality? And if so, how much of it does it affect? Pardon? Does your soul affect your personality? And if so, how much does it affect? Well, sister, our karmas definitely affect our personality. Because our personality is concerned with our parentage, with our environment, with our bringing up, with the background of our country, with our schooling. And that definitely is not in our hand. That is in the hand of the Lord, or it is in the hand of the karmas. So our karmas definitely shapes our personality, affects our personality. Soul has nothing to do with it. As I said yesterday, probably inclination of the soul is always towards his father. Soul is full with love and devotion for the father. Soul is just helpless under the weight of the mind. And mind has become slave of the senses. So we are part of this creation. Thank you. Master? Several nights ago in Delhi, the professor commented that where you were not physically present, uh, we did not have satsang, only uh, a meeting. Uh, and yet, uh, by the same token, you have said many times that where two or more are gathered together, you are there also. I wonder if you could uh, enlighten us a little bit on your thoughts on uh, our meetings. You see, the real meaning of the satsang, as Professor explained to you, is right the company of the truth. Sat means the truth. Sang means the company. Company of the truth. What is truth? Which is everlasting, which doesn't perish. That is the Lord, the Master who represents the Lord. So that is the real satsang. Others are means to achieve that end, to go back to the Father. Other means fill us you see, we have to pass through so many phases in order to reach that level. So you can't avoid these healthy group meetings. They are very, very essential for us. You call them satsang, it is a very loose term, the word satsang. So he was trying to explain the real meaning of the world. So if you think your master is there, when you are holding the meeting, your master is there. You are in His presence. That becomes the satsang for us. And if you think you are just meeting or for just eating cookies and teas and gossiping and I mean, maligning each other, then that is no satsang at all. Well, that was my impression originally, and it seemed uh, contradictory to me when I heard it uh, from the professor. I wanted uh, you to... No, there is no contradiction at all. He is giving you the literal meaning of the word. Christ said, wherever two of you is there in my name, I will be there. And if you really feel the presence of the Master, that you being in his presence and trying to talk about him, think about him, you are trying to do satsang. Thank you, Master. Master? Yes, sir. Can you explain a little bit about the Shabbat this morning during satsang? Well, brother, play on any instrument, music will be the same. I take Shabbat every day, but I have same subject matter to discuss. Nothing else, nothing new. Same thing which I discuss with you here, I discuss with them here. Them there. I used to discuss it here through the Bible with you people. There I discussed with the help of Indian mystics, Indian saints. And I have the same thing to say, same spiritual truth which has been taught by those mystics, just trying to share with all of you. It was a Shabbat by Guru Nanak. He was trying to explain that the Lord is within everybody. 
and we are separated from him because our soul has association of the mind. Mind is slave of the senses. So we are being drifted away in this ocean of creation due to our karmas. Because either we are doing good karma or we are doing bad karma, we have to come back here also to face the effect of good karma and also to face the effect of bad karma. No karma can help us to escape from this creation. Unless you rise above the, all the karmas, you clear all the karmas, good and bad, you cannot escape. He was trying to explain us, this human birth has been given to you for that very, very purpose. There is no other purpose The Lord has bestowed this grace on you, so that you may achieve your end, achieve your destination during the span of life. Then he was pitying, seeing our condition in this creation, that whatever we have done in the past, we are reaping it, their fruit now. And the same way we are committing the same mistakes, same karma, same heinous crimes, and we have absolutely forgotten that again we will have to come back to this creation to face the effect of these good and bad karmas. So he says, but still there is only one way to escape from this creation. Go to some mistake, go to some saint and tell him to correct you with their shabad and naam within yourself. And then he was trying to explain us, what is Shabbat, what is Naam? It cannot be written, it cannot be seen, it cannot be described. Your hands cannot take right there, your ears cannot hear it, your eyes cannot see it, and your feet cannot take you to that place. You can achieve that Shabbat and Naam when you will die while living. When you will be able to withdraw your consciousness to the eye center, and then you will be able to reach the door of your house. And then how to recognize that you have been able to reach the right door, and we are knocking at the right door, not at the wrong door. He says, there you will hear a melodious voice. And also you will see the light. So unless you hear that melodious voice, unless you see that light within yourself, you will not be able to travel the path which ultimately leads you back to the Father. So he says, when you are in touch with the Shabad Nalam within, slowly and slowly, automatically you will get detached from everything in this creation. That Shabad Nalam will detach you from all your worldly love, all your worldly emotions, all your worldly property, all your worldly objects. Because if you get something better, you automatically forget the lower things at all. So if you get that taste of that nectar, which is within everyone here at the eye center, automatically your mind leaves the sensual pleasures. There is no other way for you to withdraw your mind from the sensual pleasure. Because mind is fond of sensual pleasure. Unless mind gets a better pleasure than the sensual pleasure, mind refuses to leave the sensual pleasure. And that the better pleasure Lord has kept within every one of us here at the eye center. That is known as the living water, that is known as Abe Hayat by Muslim, Amrit by the Indian mystics. And that Amrit, that living water, is not somewhere outside at all. It is right here springing like a fountain with every one of us at here at the eye center. If you taste that, automatically you will be detached from all the senses. With the help of that Shabad and Naam, call it nectar, call it Shabad and Naam, it's one and the same thing, you'll be able to come back to Tirkuti, second stage, the seat of the mind and mind. Then your soul gets released from the clutches of the mind. Then you become whole. Now, previously, mind were dominating, dominating the soul. Now your soul dominates the mind. First, mind was your master, now soul is your master. Once the soul becomes the master, you become whole. Then you become worthy to become one with the pure one, the Father. Unless you become worthy to become, unless you become whole, you cannot become, merge back into the whole, which is the Father. Then, then he was trying to explain us uh, by giving very beautiful examples that we try to withdraw our mind 
from the sensual pleasures by discipline, by reading holy books, by running away from the situation, by hiding in the forest and jungles, and by reciting holy books, by taking bath into the holy waters, and by pilgrimages into the holy places. He says you can never succeed. This is just like putting a poisonous snake in a basket. As long as the snake is there in the basket, you are definitely have saved yourself from its sting. But you are always frightened when the snake may come and again bite you, again harm you. So if you just catch the snake and take out this poison from the snake, it becomes harmless. You can put it around your neck. So no problem with the snake at all. So he says, this is just a temporary relief on your mind by these austerities, by discipline, by running away from the situation, by hiding from the situation. He says, these are temporary measures. You are just creating suppression in your mind. When it becomes too much, the mind will make you dance on its own finger. So he says, this way you cannot control your mind. Then he gives a very beautiful example. He says, especially in those days, when Guru Nanak wrote that if there is a snake bite, if snake gives bite to somebody, snake gives a poison to somebody, we used to call these, uh, uh, you see, these pipe men, you see, I don't know what you call them, you see, they will play the music and, you see, then their snake will come. And then there is a small... I mean, uh, small thing, something in the snake, they put that on that uh, wound and it sucks the whole poison from the body and you save the patient. He says, nowadays you go to a doctor, he puts you the injection and you are safe from the poison of the snake. So similarly, Gunarik says, if you want to get rid of the poison of your mind, go to some mystic, go to some adept, go to some saint. He will put you in touch with the Shabbat and Naam within. As you will go on taking, getting into the taste of Shabbat and Naam within, automatically this poison of the world will just leave you. So he says that is the only way to control your mind. Then he explains us, <coughs> perhaps you may be thinking, what is the necessity to control the mind? What is the harm in the sensual pleasures? Why not enjoy these senses at all? He gives another very beautiful example. He says, this, look at this crocodile, all this big whale. It has one weakness of eating meat. So what these people, I mean, those people, you see fishermen who try to catch those I mean, uh, big uh, crocodiles and all that, they know the weakness of that whale. They put small piece of meat with a hook iron hook. And that hook is there, got caught into the neck of that crocodile or that whale. And that whole whale is caught, such a big whale, you see, then it is cut into the pieces and people eat it and enjoy its flesh. He said, just imagine, what a big I mean, crocodile, how strong it was. Nobody dare touch him, go near him. But one weakness, what is the condition of that? whale of that crocodile. So similarly he says that whale has only one weakness. And don't forget you have five weaknesses. You have calm, you have growth, you have low, mo, hankar. And have you ever thought what heinous thing, heinous crime, heinous action you do under the sway of your mind? You will have to pay for everything what you do in this creation. He says this, all this world is just like a field Whatever you sow in the field, you will have to go to that field to collect that crop. Nobody can help you. You have to go to that crop. If it is a chili, you will have to collect the chili. If it is the apple, you will have to eat the apple. So it also only grows what you sow. So similarly, Christ, I mean, so similarly, Guru Nanak says, you must be cautious what you are doing during the span of your life. He says, by attaching yourself to the worldly faces, by becoming victim of the senses, 
and you are putting a loose around your neck. Didn't you realize that the, at that time of doing these doing these karmas that you will have to account for? There is somebody who knows what you have been doing, and at that time you think nobody watches me. It is absolutely dark night. Doors are closed. There is no witness at all. I can do whatever I feel like. Guru Nanak says, "Have you forgotten? The Lord was right within you. You can receive anybody. You can receive yourself, but you cannot receive the Lord who was right there within you every minute. You can receive everybody, but you can't receive the Lord. He is watching you 24 hours. He is seeing you 24 hours. You can't conceal anything from him at all." He knows your intention. He knows your actions. So he warns us that you be careful what you do. And then Guru Nanak was explaining us that uh, you are always talking about getting salvation after death. He says, what guarantee you have that you will get salvation after death? If you are illiterate now, nobody is going to give you PhD degree after death. If you are a criminal now, nobody is going to declare you a saint after your death. Whatever you want to achieve, you must achieve during your span of this life. You must seek their salvation right now. Don't think your relations will help, your money will help, or people after you die, they will be able to help you to get the salvation. He says, no, you are living in illusion. You will have to do yourself during your span of this life. And then, in the end, you see, he was trying to explain us that, uh, just see, parrot is so fond of this cage, and similarly, our soul is in love with this body, with this flesh. It is shifting from flesh to flesh, it is shifting from body to body. He says, if the parrot leaves the love of the cage, it can fly. Similarly, if our soul, mind not together, if it leaves the love of this body, it can go back to the Father. He says, but when this soul has been imprisoned in this flesh, in this body, since ages and ages, since the creation, how can the soul so easily leave the love of this flesh, love of this body? Ulan says there is only one way. The Lord has kept that nectar within every one of us here at the eye center. Lord, Lord has kept that food within every one of us here at the eye center, Shabbat. So withdraw your consciousness to the eye center and feed that parrot with that Shabbat and Naam. Drink that nectar from within yourself. You automatically, love of this flesh will go away from you. And automatically you will withdraw from everyone in this creation and the soul will soar back to the level of the Father. He said, this is the only way that you can make best use of your human birth and for this very purpose the Lord has bestowed upon you this human favor. This was the nutshell of all what we discussed. Thank you, Master. Master? Yes, please. I have two questions. Yes, uh, The first question is, when we're holding a, ch a child or a loved one in our arms and we're doing Simran, is there any beneficial effect on the, the loved one that we're holding through our Simran? You mean you're holding a child in your arm, your own? Hmm? Or another child. Another child, and you are doing Simran. Yes. And you want the child should also be affected by that? I don't know. I don't know if there's any effect on anybody else. Well, if child can be influenced by the good atmosphere in which he is being cared for, if you are fighting with somebody, abusing somebody, naturally child will be affected with that. Child will learn all those. If the atmosphere is very holy, very noble, very loving, very kind, and child gets if he is being brought up in that atmosphere, naturally he will be affected by that. Okay, thank you. My second question was, um, I didn't understand what a sin against the Holy Spirit 
was it was uh, sister it mean that putting your back to meditation you see what christ meant was that only meditation the holy ghost can seek forgiveness from the lord for all your actions for all your karma there no other way that your you can be forgiven for your karmas except to attend to the holy ghost so if you put your back to the holy ghost you are sinning against the holy ghost the lord has kept that such a wealth within you as you are sinning you are sinning yourself you are not making proper use of this opportunity by putting your back to that holy ghost which is right within you so you can never be forgiven for all those karmas which are dragging you to the level of this creation you can never be forgiven so unless you are forgiven for those karmas you will never be able to go back to the father so sin against the holy ghost means not attending to your meditation thank you master when is it appropriate to apologize to somebody and what is the benefit of an apology so master yes when is it appropriate to apologize and what are the benefits of apologizing well appropriate is whenever you get the opportunity whenever you feel like apologizing that is the right opportunity and benefit is that you do not feel guilty within yourself you you don't carry unnecessary guilt with you otherwise you are always feeling guilty by not apologizing to a person whom you have transgressed his rights or whom you have hurted you always feel guilty and there's a weight on your mind is it correct to expect an apology from somebody else pardon is it correct to expect an apology from somebody else it is not correct to expect apology without expecting you should forgive the person even that, without them apologize that is the right attitude because if you are expecting somebody to apologize you you are still creating that link between you and him you and the other person you are expecting him to do why should you expect you be brave you just forget about it you forgive him whether he asks for it or not you don't want his reward you don't want his consequences whatever he may have done against your rights you just forgive him if he apologizes you just tell him that i have already forgiven you but don't try to expect that when he may come and apologize me thank you maharaj we're right here yes maharaj yes here. please where did desire originally come from who desire where did desire originally come from mind there are all the offspring of mind sister it is the mind mind is doing the actions mind is creating the desires mind become victim of desires there are all the offspring of the mind thank you this master When the master gives drishti is that the same radiant form that the disciple will eventually see in meditation what do you mean by giving drishti my understanding of drishti is when a special glance of the master to the satsangi which where, where did you read that in which santmat book did you find it well i'm asking that's Hmm? I don't think I found it in the book. Then how do you interpret that? I think it must be the same, but I'm not certain. I thought that the radiant Drishti is a very simple word in Hindi when you look at somebody. It has no other spiritual meaning. Thank you. Maharaji, what is sharir? Vani Sharir, it's a word you use in at satsang in the morning. What is that? Sharir, a Hindi word, I think. Shabir. Sharir. Shariyat. Huh. Code of living. 
You see, mode of living of our religion. Are, every religion has certain way of living. Some people keep long beard, tight turbans, long kurtas. Other, you see, go to churches, they cover their heads. Some uncover their heads. Some had long, you see, shave here, and some keep small beards, and some different type of caps. Some keep two, some just clean their, I mean, shave their heads. These are different mode of religion, you see, way of religion, way of living in the religions. There's nothing to do with spirituality. You used it so frequently, at certain points I thought it must be something special. No, I was trying to explain that there, these all things are meaningless. <laughs> if you put a brocade on an ass, he's not going to become a first pedigree horse. <laughs> he will remain an ass. <laughs> but changing our clothes and I mean, appearing in a particular way, you don't become a very religious person. There's a wrong concept with the people, you see. I often give an example in the satsang, though in a very mild way. I say, you need only photo frame if the picture is beautiful. You need only a case for keeping jewelry. You see, if the jewelry is there, you need scaffold if the sword is there. But when the sword is not there, jewelry is not there, picture is not there, what will you do with this photo frame and that box for keeping ornaments and that scaffold? The no use, meaningless things. The basic of religion is spirituality, which the teachers, which the mystics have taught us. If the foundation is not there, mere wearing tie, certain type of dresses, ceremonially going on Sundays or Mondays to temple or church or I mean, burning this light and burning this candle and doing this and doing that, they are all meaningless things. If the spirituality is not there, if you have no love for the Lord, the main thing is love for the Lord. Nothing in conversion, whether you call yourself Hindu or Christian or Sikh, it is meaningless. It is less just changing your clothes, changing your appearances. But that doesn't change you, what you are. We have to change ourselves. That is more essential. That is what I was trying to emphasize from Guru Nanak's uh, teachings. Thank that you. The real thing is spirituality, on which every religion is based. No religion creates any, no mystery creates any religions. They only share their spiritual experience with us. It is we who after the depart of that mystic or a saint rest his teaching into small groups, small organizations, and slowly and slowly give it a name of some sort of ism or a religion. And we become fanatic. Reality is lost and we hold on to those shells and feel very happy that we are very religious people. That is I was trying to explain. <laughs> What uh, do these uh, blessings have to do with Saint Mat? Pardon? What do these blessings have to do with Saint Mat? <coughs> what is that? Blessing? Have to do with Saint Mat? I've not followed your point. The blessings, the blessings you give, uh, I don't uh, understand what they have to do with Saint Mat. Blessing has to do anything with karma? With uh, Saint Mat? It's a blessing. Prashad. No, if you think that by eating prasad you are clearing your karma, you are wrongly mistaken. It doesn't clear your karma at all. It reminds you of the teaching of your master, of your meditation. If you remember your master, attend to your teaching, and uh, live the teaching, and attend to your meditation, that will clear karma. These are all strong means to remind us. The picture in the house of a friend doesn't substitute a friend. It only reminds us about the friend. These prasads are just means to remind us about our meditation, about the teaching, about the Master who has given us. 
Don't think that by eating it you'll be able to all clear your karma, otherwise nothing could be more simpler than that. Can you tell uh, something about the five melodies, the five well, sounds? Well, brother, what is there to explain about those melodies? Well, well different, uh, every stage has its own music, our own melody. Actually, the sound is only one, but since it is coming through five mentions, five stages, so you hear differently at every stage. Otherwise, it is the same. Which is to be experienced. What can you describe about that? Thank you. Um, am I talking? Yes, please. <laughs> I just, okay. Um, I'm nervous. Sometimes when we have been abused by another person, we say that we forgive them in our mind, but in our heart, Sister, forgive us. We, we are still hurt and afraid. Could you give us some down-to-earth advice on how to forgive and to forget? Sister, forgiveness comes from the heart. It doesn't come just by mere words. Words you may or may not utter, but it has to come from the heart. You may not, it may not be so easy to forget, but it may be very easy to forgive. And if you really forgive, slowly and slowly you forget the incident also. Thank you. Master, in meditation... Yes, yes. In meditation, I have difficulty doing Simran and Dion simultaneously. When I concentrate on one, the other one goes. Am I doing something wrong? Well, sister, there is nothing wrong. We have to continue. Meditation is not so easy. Thank and you. we shouldn't take it very easily to meditation also. It's a very difficult job, but we have to attend to it. Thank you. Slowly and slowly, mind automatically comes and enjoys that meditation. Thank you, Master. Master, it seems uh, that as we get older, the mind seems to become more powerful. And um, I was wondering if that's possible, and if so, why? Well, mind is always powerful. We are becoming more weak. And mind, the more we grow, the more mind also grows into this creation. It also more spreads into this creation. We have more desires, more contacts, more acquaintances. Naturally, mind will spread more and more. Does the mind become more powerful as we make more progress? If, if we were to make more progress on mind, that... I can't say it becomes powerful, but definitely it becomes very active. We have to be at our... Uh, absolutely alert with the mind. It becomes quite active. Thank you. Maharaji, in meditation, when it comes time to do bhajan, if, if the mind is particularly scattered, can we return and do the simran for the rest of the time, or should we always sit for bhajan? No well, way? you can. There is no hard and fast rule about it. You can attend to the simran all the time, but it is always better to give some time to Shabbat also, so that you may also get into the habit of hearing sound. Thank you. Maharaji, can you explain to us a bit about seva and the attitude towards seva? Pardon? Could you tell us a bit about seva and the attitude we should have towards seva? Well, sister, seva is done with love and affection. 
to please another person. Seva is not done to boss over other people or to show your superiority over other people. Seva is done to create humility within ourselves. The more humble we are, the better we are on the path. So it definitely creates humility in us. We have to, in Seva, we have to meet all sorts of people. Some are cold, some are warm, some are blowing horn and some are very smiling. I mean, all sorts of people we have to adjust to because we want to please them. It's a great adjustment we we find in Seva. It's a great challenge to us to please them, how to please them. When we are doing seva and we clash with another individual, how should we deal with that? Should we just leave it or should we, how should we deal with it? If we are doing it with love. Doing what for? If we are doing our seva with love and that person takes offense to what we have told them to do or what we are doing with them, how do we deal with that? Sister, every situation has its own aspect. And you can't say do's and don'ts in every any situation, in every situation. One has to adjust to that situation and he knows best how to adjust. Thank you. Master, um, there's an on RS greetings issue about, about Simran, the whole issue is about Simran. It's a, I keep reading it over and over to remind, try to remind me how important Simran is. And in this issue of the RS greetings, you're quoted as saying that it's only by great good luck that one takes to Simran. And I was wondering what you meant by that. You ask the writer, what does he mean? You're, it's, it's a quote, you're quoted as saying that it's only by great good luck that one takes to Simran. And I wonder what, what, what does it really take for it to have that ceaseless symbol? Well, I don't know in what context I said, but it is due to the grace of the Lord that we attend to our meditation. It is just by His mere grace that we attend to meditation. And Simran is a part of meditation. Thank you. Master, Master, <clears throat> To your left. Yes. Uh, you said that during bhajan we are to close the right side. During initiation, I was told, or at least I remember, uh, that we were told to uh, close the left, the left side. Did I mishear the instructions? Well, you should know better. Instructions are very clear. You have to close your right thumb. You can ask them. If you would like to read the instruction, they will oblige you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mahai Vikhain, Melian Saab, Duke Hovandur, O my love on meeting you, all my sorrows vanish. It's from Beulah Shah. And I just wanted to say that we are the happiest ones here. And the ones who are left behind are the most sad. I know that all of us have brought many loving Radhaswami greetings to you from the satsangis in the places from which we came. And they are the sad ones. Well, sister, those who couldn't come, they are not far away from us. They are also with us here. That's true. They are as near and dear to me as you all are sitting here. It will be nice for them to hear that when we return. Master. Master. Yes, please. Our Satmap literature tries to describe the greatness of the Master. It tries to compare the Guru with a lotus flower, it says that the roots of the lotus plant are in the mud and its uh, stem and leaves are in the water, in the muddy water. But its blossom, the flower is in the air and it basks in the sun. So it compares this with our Guru 
and it seems that the feet of the master are in this material plane. He exists also in all the regions, and his head is an anami and such kind. Now, master, the question is, um, is the master fully conscious of all the regions, even at this moment, at any moment? You see, first time I'd like to correct you. This is not written about the master. It is written how we have to live in this world. Just like that flower, lotus flower, which has roots in the mud and flower above the water. So similarly, discharging our worldly obligation, accounting for our karmic accounts, we have to live in this world and yet we not, not be of this world, yet we have to rise above everything with the help of meditation. Just a duck lives in the water, but it flies, it flies absolutely dry wings. That way we have to live in this world. These examples have been given by Guru Nanak. Not about the master, but about, about us who are on the path. I have another question, Master. Um, our Sanat literature again uh, uh, describes progress in the inner regions as, as that of an ant climbing a mound of sand very laboriously. It steps on one grain of sand after the other, but since it is loose, uh, its lips keeps falling down to the bottom of the mound. So again, it uh, it tries to climb up again, and uh, this happens continuously. Now, in the next stage, they say that uh, spiritual progress is like a spider climbing up to the ceiling on a single strand. Again, very laboriously, the uh, Spider climbs arm over arm or hand over hand up the single strand until it eventually reaches the ceiling. Now, when he, when the soul proceeds on to the next region, it is now like a fish. It swims upstream uh, swiftly with uh, the use of its tail and fins through the water. And finally, in the uh, very high regions, it is like a bird. It starts from the valley and in a short, in a few minutes time or in just a short period, it is able to reach the mountain tops. And again, at the, uh, um, probably in such God, it says that uh, the soul will be able to ascend to such God almost instantaneously. Now my question, Master, is what is it, especially in the first region, which, uh, no. which uh, pulls us down to the bottom of the mound? No, brother, the question is that our progress is very, very slow to begin with. And as we progress upward, progress also is not so slow. We also accelerate in our progress. In the beginning, progress is very, very slow. Now, give any type of examples. Okay, thank you, Maharaji. Master. Yes. Master, many times um, we do not complete our allocated time for meditation. Uh, I was just... I was just wondering at the causes of this. Do we have a general who is very, very lenient with us, or are we soldiers very, very lazy? I'm not following. Can you repeat your question? Master, many times we do not complete our allocated time for meditation. That's daily. Uh, I was just wondering about the cause of this. Do we have a general or master who is very, very lenient with us? Well, that may be the reason, or we may also be very lazy about it. They can be both to be blamed, perhaps. Just one more, Master. How can we get to love you the way you want us to love you? Attend to your meditation. <clears throat> Brother, meditation creates love. It helps it to grow and to grow and grow to become one with the Father. 
it is the meditation which increases our love and depth of devotion and ultimately helps us to merge with the being. It is just meditation. Master, <coughs> over here, to your left. Okay, okay. Uh, we've spoken about uh, free will a couple times here this week, and um, it's gotten my mind going, unfortunately. Um, my mind feels that there is no free will. Uh, and you said that there was limited free will only in our attitude and, uh, and our thoughts and our effort. But it seems to me even that is, is already destined. Is that true? Well, you can say it's true. But then we don't want to feel that we are puppets. We have ego which doesn't want to admit that we have nothing in our head. But actually, to some extent, it is true. Because everything begins from Him. If He doesn't begin, nothing can be achieved. Pull has to start from Him. Seed has to be sown by Him. So unless the seed is sown, how can we expect it will grow? But our destiny is already predetermined. Absolutely. You see, destiny, what we call is predetermined, <coughs> it is not just written by somebody what we have to go through. These are our old, our own karmas which we have to face during this span of life. We have committed those karmas. Nobody else has done those karmas. So we have brought our destiny out of those karmas which we have been to be committing in the past. Nobody indiscriminately has just written that face this, face this, face this, face this. It is our own committed karmas which we have, which we have to go through, their effects here in this span of life. Now, when a case comes before a judge, Judge just doesn't indiscriminately tell him, you are acquitted or you are hanged. He has a long list of evidence before him. So many witnesses come, so many corroborations are there, medical report is there. Before he gives a judgment, all that whole record of that accused is before the judge. Keeping in view that record, he says acquitted or hanged. Now, the accused thinks that judge is merciless, he has hanged me. And other man will say, he is very, very nice man, very good man, he just acquitted me. Neither the judge is merciless, nor he is very harsh, very cruel. His, he has own, he, he is the one who gives his own judgment. His crime is before the judge. That evidence is before the judge. Judge hound hands are bound by the evidence which he has before, which is in the file. How can the Lord judge us or how does hold us accountable when we have no choice in our actions? Well, to begin with, we can say we have choice. When you start playing chess, first move is in your head. Then all moves are conditioned to the pre first move. I have never played chess in my life. <laughs> That's what I am told. <laughs> then he is just entrapped. One move leads to another move, one moves another move. So similarly, karmas create karmas, then those karmas create more karmas, and those, those, those karmas create more karmas. So we go on rolling. And the only way off is... The only way to get out of is His grace, yeah. if you ask me. Nothing else. If His grace is there, marking will be there. If His grace is there, we will be brought into some good company. 
If his grace is there, we will find ourselves steadfast on the path. We will have an opportunity, an environment, atmosphere in which we can build our meditation. And his grace is there that we become one with him. At every step it is his grace. Process will be the same, but we can't go through that process without his grace. <coughs> so it's best to surrender. And do your best. Master, is it possible for a, a satsangi, old initiate or newly initiate, to leave? Is it possible as, for a satsangi to leave the mind and remain only the soul for about a week? You mean it is on our hand to leave the mind back? Yes. If it is possible, nobody will like to have the mind. So how and can the moment the soul is left alone, it doesn't stay alone; it goes back to its own source. So how can and we, we just come to an end? How can we perform that? How Le can we leave, leaving the mind and retaining only the soul? You can leave the mind behind by attending to the shabad within. Shabad will help you to pull to the level of the source of the mind. But and when the mind comes to that source from where it originated downward, then the soul will get released from the clutches of the mind. How should the satsangi feel when he feels the mind, when he leaves the mind and retains only his soul? How does it feel? Bliss, peace, happiness. Thank you. What does the lover feel when he comes to the beloved? Happiness. What, what does he feel? Very happy. Then? Thank you very much. Um, could you help me understand the um, relationship between the inner master and the outer master, and whether they're the same thing or a different thing, and how they work together? Our relationship with uh, them or their relationship with each other? Well, kind of how how that works. I don't under it. I don't understand yet how that works. That there's you know the inner master and the outer Sister, master. Sister, it's a very simple thing. Our real master is Shabad and Nam, world made flesh. Flesh is not the master. World is the master which is in the flesh. And that flesh is here in the body. That flesh is there inside. And that flesh is the master. There are not two masters at all. It is the Shabad which is our master. Shabad here projects before us through the flesh. There it projects through us in the through the radiant form. Shabad the same. There are not there are not two shabads at all. So it's all one thing. So that what I have on the inside is the same thing as what I see on the outside with the master. You see, it's like the master can be there and in me at the same time. Is that right? Yes, you can interpret whatever way you like. I have told you. Thank you. Master. Can Master please tell me why uh, a person would hear sound and then the sound goes away for a long time, even if that person continues with meditation? Why the sound? Goes away. It's, it's gone. You, it, that person doesn't hear the sound anymore for a long time. Well, brother, sound never leaves us. We leave the sound. Our mind gets scattered. Our mind gets entangled into the worldly affairs, worldly problems. And it is not there where it should be. So we think sound has lost. We have lost the sound. Actually, we have lost the sound. Sound is always there. Thank you, Master. Master, could you tell me what it means when somebody's blasphemed the Lord? When what? somebody's blasphemed the Lord, could you tell me what that means? I don't know what you mean. It doesn't make any difference to the Lord at all. Okay, thank you. You, you may say him anything, you may praise him, you may abuse him. He is there as he as he is. It doesn't make him any any difference at all. Master, on your left. I'm not sure if this is a new question. Yes. Um, over here. Yes, please. I'm not sure if this is a new question. Can I ask it? 
Can I ask? Did you say yes? <laughs> can I ask? Can I ask this question? I'm not sure if it's a new one. Or yes, not. you can ask even the old ones. <laughs> Is it true that you watch television? Yes, I, I, I do. <laughs> do you enjoy it more than, say, giving satsang? I enjoy more than satsang? Yeah. No, I don't say I enjoy more than satsang. I perhaps enjoy more in satsang than anywhere else. Thank you. Maraji? It seems that the longer one's on the path, um, one develops a sensitivity. You develop a sensitivity to the good things, but there is also a sensitivity to the negative things in life. Um, one is sensitive to kindness, but one is also very, seems to be more sensitive to anger and to negativity as well. Can you comment on that? Well, it may, it may be the individual, you, but you can't generalize it. It may be with the individual people. Some people are more subdued, more calm, more blissful, kind, loving as they grow in meditation. You can't say with everybody is like that. I have seen people changing tremendously in meditation. So when we have a sensitivity in, uh, the, in the Sangat towards each other, uh, and there is a negativity, one should just try to, just to be calm with it. Well, you can analyze yourself, what is the, what is lacking and how to overcome it. Uh, it was leading on from this question, your answer on anger the other day. Yes. Um, it also seems that when one is working, that one is prey to, um, to that, to negativity and to, to anger. Uh, if one's, for instance, in a teaching profession where you sometimes you have to show anger because it's a means of teaching. Uh, well, you show anger, but there's no anger in your heart. You mean the good of the disciple. There is no anger. When you're dealing with children. You, I mean, you're, you mean good for the disciple. Yes. For the children. Yes. There's no anger at all. Mother also becomes angry to the child. Not that she hates the child, but she loves the child. She wants to reform the child. That is the only attitude he understands. It's There's very, no anger at all. It's a very thin line. Sometimes you can do it and suddenly you find yourself slipping into the real emotion. Well, then you have to draw a line. Because it says in the books that one should try to lead a simple life, as simple as possible, um, and if you find that you are in a profession where you do have to use um, anger or, or the emotions, is it better to keep away from that or is that just karma? You just go through it. It depends upon the individuals. You can't generalize such situations at all. Hmm. It depends upon the individuals how to handle their situation. Everybody has a different type of temperament and he has to deal with his own temperament. And with a different type of situation, he knows best how to handle it. Thank you, <clears throat> Master, you just said uh, the Shabbat never goes away. That Shabbat? The Shabbat. That it isn't that it goes away from us, it's that we go away from it. I find if I spend time alone, it's much easier to progress spiritually. But we're not supposed to spend all of our time alone. How can we retain our spiritual progress if we don't spend time alone? Well, when you yourself understand it, then you should deal accordingly. Thank you, Master. Maharaji? Uh, I feel a little frustrated and angry right now, and Pardon? I'm a little frustrated and angry about uh, what what I've come to be as a satsangi. I don't know if that's really, it's not even really the appropriate term for what I feel for myself. And I, I don't understand why 
uh, the, the Lord wants to extend his grace to a satsangi to bring him onto the path to give him the, uh, you know, the, the route back home, why he can come to a point where he's uh, technically on the path backsliding. Uh, you know, I, I've got a problem, and it, I, f- I feel it coming up again, and I uh, don't feel strong enough to really be able to feel comfortable that when I go back home, I'm going to be able to deal with it in a, in a satsangi, an appropriate satsangi fashion. What is the problem? Oh, uh, I'm drinking alcohol. Huh? Alcohol. You know it's bad? I know it's bad. Then leave it. If you know, then try to get rid of it. Well, it's like, I'll explain why I feel like I need to anesthetize myself. I just don't want to think, I don't want to be, and I just, you know, I I feel lousy and I want to go out and just stop it. I don't know how to stop it. That habit. Well, brother, you have to have very strong willpower to leave it. If If anybody thinks one can slowly and slowly one will leave it, you can never leave it. Whenever you will leave it, at once you will leave it. Otherwise we can never leave it. We have to become very strong to leave such drugs. Well, it's like my meditation, supposedly, I mean, you know, they say the virtues like cream rise, you know, to the top through, you know, this meditation, this effort of meditation. And it seems like that the virtues haven't arisen, it seems like the, the lower tendencies of my mind have surfaced and dominated. But brother, if the foundation is not strong, what is the sense of building over it? Well, what was, what was weak about my foundation? These, unless you lift the principle, the foundation is not strong at all. Well, I thought I was living them. Hmm? I thought I was living, living the, you know, doing the, the, the four vows. I thought I was doing those things. And, and the result is that I'm weaker. So, live the Santmat way of life and attend to your meditation. You needn't worry otherwise. All right. Thank you.